Since the dawn of civilization, tales have been told of a mysterious purple crystal with strange, inexplicable powers. From the distant past to the 21st century, the stories are intriguingly similar. All describe a small piece of violet-colored quartz said to possess the ability to defy both time and space. Here one moment, gone the next, the crystal purportedly disappears, then rematerializes minutes, days, months, even years later, often in an entirely different location. Descriptions of the purple crystal and its unusual qualities can be found in every culture on every continent. From prehistoric artifacts and primitive cave drawings to modern-day books, movies, television shows, and internet websites, mankind has continued to document and record the extraordinary properties of this remarkable gemstone and to chronicle the influential role it has played throughout the annals of human history. Yet despite the crystal's renown, how much do we really know about it? Throughout the centuries, those with intimate knowledge of the stone have claimed that whoever possesses the purple crystal can use its unusual powers to travel outside of time from one place to another, anywhere on Earth, even to other dimensions. Are the stories true? Could they possibly account for the strange controversy surrounding the woman who is said to be the gemstone's current guardian? Do new cutting-edge theories in the field of modern physics perhaps hold the key to providing, at last, a rational scientific explanation for the crystal's allegedly magical qualities? Or is there something more at work here? Something that shall forever remain beyond the realm of human comprehension? Something not of our world. There are many famous gemstones throughout the world. The Hope Diamond, the Star of India, the Black Prince Opal, the Crown of Cortez Emerald. Yet for all their renown, none is as intriguing or as mysterious as the legendary Purple Crystal. While other gems are prized for their exceptional beauty or unique design, the purple crystal is coveted not for its outward appearance, but for its unseen inner power. But what kind of a gem is it? What are its origins? What are its physical characteristics? The purple crystal. Where to begin? Well, let's start with the basics. It's an amethyst which is a quartz that has a purple or violet hue. And the purple crystal is a specific type of Brazilian quartz known as an ama egg. Though I should point out that ama eggs come in a variety of colors, not just purple. Take this one, for example. This ama egg is a piece of rose quartz. Except for the color difference, it's nearly identical in size and shape to its famous cousin. Both have the frosted exterior and ovoid or egg shape. And both have been cut open 
and the inner surface polished to reveal a semi-transparent window through which you can look into the heart of the stone. But that's where the similarity ends. Because in every other regard, the purple crystal is a stone like no other. I've spent many years of my life tracking its path through history. And I can tell you that the crystal has been working its special brand of magic for a very, very long time. Ancient Egypt, land of the pharaohs. Some of the earliest known written references to the purple crystal appear in 15 parchment scrolls that were inscribed over 4,000 years ago. Known as the Glyphs of Giza, these ancient works lay untouched through the millennia until 1919 when they were found by two children playing in a cave not far from the city of Cairo. Is the tale that is told in the glyphs merely a myth? Or does it perhaps explain one of the greatest architectural mysteries of all time? When the glyphs of Giza were first discovered in 1919, they were considered so controversial that only a handful of scholars were allowed access to the scrolls. In fact, it wasn't until 1958 that the story they tell was finally released to the rest of the world. It begins with Osiris god of the dead. According to the glyphs of Giza, Osiris had in his possession a purple crystal. He endowed the crystal with magical powers and gave the gemstone to his wife, the goddess Isis, so that she could use it to travel back and forth to the afterworld and visit him. Isis treasured the crystal and kept it in a pouch made of translucent thread which she wore tied to her right forearm. Because of the gem's violet color, it became known throughout the land as the sacred bruise of Isis. The first part of the story offers a slightly different take on the legend of Isis and Osiris, but it doesn't stray too far away from traditional Egyptian lore. It isn't until Isis loses the magic crystal that things begin to shift a little off-center. How did the crystal go missing? One morning, when Isis was bathing in the Nile, a heron wading in the shallows caught a glint of the crystal where the goddess had placed it for safekeeping in the reeds along the shore. Dazzled by the gem's brilliance, the heron snatched the glittering prize and took flight. Jubilant with his catch, the bird gave a loud, boastful cry and the crystal fell from his beak and dropped into the deepest part of the Nile. When Isis realized that her treasure gem was gone, she used all her many powers to try and find it. But the great river did not give up its secret, not even to the mighty goddess. If the tale had ended with the crystal being dropped in the Nile, I doubt that the glyphs of Giza would have caused much controversy at all. But of course, the story doesn't end there. In fact, most people would say that's where the real story begins. For many centuries, the crystal remained at the bottom of the great river. Yet, with each passing year, when the flood water surged, the gem slowly tumbled northward toward the delta. Until one day, after the water had receded, a priest named Tal Ahar found the crystal lying exposed on a bed of reeds. Kalahar picked up the gem and took it home with him. And that night he had a dream. And in the dream, Horus, the son of Isis, appeared and told Kalahar that the purple gem was magical and had the power to transport objects of great weight. Take the crystal to the pharaoh, commanded Horus so that he can use it to build a huge monument. When Kalahar awakened, however, the crystal had already begun to take a powerful hold on him, and he couldn't bring himself to part with it. Caught in the throes of temptation, the troubled priest ventured alone into the wilderness, 
where for forty days and forty nights he fasted and he prayed until at last he broke free from the spell of the crystal. Without delay, he took the gem to the royal palace and presented it along with the dream's message to the great pharaoh Khufu. And many years later, when construction of the great pyramid was complete, the mummified body of the loyal priest Kalahar was laid to rest in a hidden cavity not far from the king's royal chamber. What I find amazing is that 50 years ago, only a few scholars knew the contents of the scrolls. Now, it's a wide open field of study, with all kinds of theories being put forward and explored. Who knows where the research will lead next? Where indeed? A crystal capable of moving heavy rocks without effort might very well account for other unusual wonders throughout the world. It's impossible to know all the many ways in which the purple crystal was used in the antiquities, but the Bible and other ancient texts suggest that it remained in Egypt until the 10th century BC, when it came into the hands of King Solomon the Wise. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David. The Egyptian bride bore with her a dowry gem, bestowing Solomon with great advantage over his enemies, and they did fear him as the ghost who sprang among them and was gone. There is much speculation about how Solomon used the stone and where he hid it for safekeeping. Centuries passed until the crystal resurfaced in the Middle Ages. During the Crusades, the Knights Templars found it when they established their headquarters in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And we know that they kept the stone in their possession and guarded it carefully for at least several hundred years. There are many who believe, and with good reason, that the crystal is in fact the Holy Grail that the Knights Templar were sworn to protect custody of the stone can be traced to many noted members of the secret society of Templars, including Leonardo da Vinci, Nostradamus, John Dee, and Sir Isaac Newton. Perhaps most telling are church archives confirming that the crystal was eventually taken to Scotland and hidden in Rosslyn Chapel, along with many other Templar treasures. The big question, of course, the big mystery is how the crystal eventually came into the possession of the beautiful young Scottish heiress, Fiona St. Clair Glengarry. However it was that Fiona acquired the stone, it is through her that the crystal came to the attention of the modern world. The wheels were set in motion when she married an Englishman named Edward Harper Fairchild. Fairchild was the youngest son in a very well-to-do London family. His hobby was writing these cheap little serialized adventure novels known as Penny Dreadfuls. He wrote about 20 in all, but I think his most popular by far was the Cornwall Jack adventure series. The title character of that one was John Higgins, who by day owned a little curio shop in St. Ives, but by night he was Cornwall Jack, a notorious outlaw and a smuggler along the Cornish coastline. The first two books in the series did moderately well, but in the third book, that's when Fairchild added his little supernatural twist, and that's when the series really took off. The title of the third book was The Alchemist's Treasure. The story opens with Cornwall Jack waylaying a ship bound for a secret monastery in France. Among the spoils, he finds a number of trunks that once belonged to a famous medieval alchemist and magician. Inside the trunks, Jack discovers all sorts of occult objects and jewels, including a small piece of purple quartz. As Jack picks up the crystal, he starts thinking about a jeweler he knows in London who might give a good price for the stone. Instantly, Jack finds himself 250 miles away, standing in front of the jeweler's shop. It doesn't take Jack long to realize that he has come into possession of the legendary traveling stone. 
a magical talisman that allowed its owner to travel anywhere in the blink of an eye. To Fairchild's readership, the traveling stone was no stranger, for it played a part in many old Celtic folk tales that have been told for centuries all throughout the British Isles. The alchemist's treasure was a huge success. So, of course, Fairchild wrote a sequel about Jack and his magic crystal called The Terror of London. And it's probably best known as the book in which Jack gives the stone its name. In chapter two of The Terror of London, Jack's friend, Banty Lake Pete, asks Jack how he was able to avoid what seemed like certain capture by the police. Jack is not about to reveal that he has the traveling stone and he gives this cryptic reply. Why, it was my good friend Purple Thomas who saved my hide. Purple Tom Frosty, some call him. Twere nothing for Purple Tom to help me give them bobbies a slip. The Terror of London went immediately into second and third printings. So, Fairchild quickly wrote another book in the series, The Adventures of Cornwall Jack and Purple Tom. And that one sold more copies than all of Fairchild's other works put together. Sadly, The Adventures of Cornwall Jack and Purple Tom would be the last book that Edward Harper Fairchild would ever write, for it seems he wrote a little too well. In neighborhood pubs and gathering places all over England, rumors had begun to circulate that Fairchild actually had the fabled stone in his possession. How else, they reasoned, could he write about it so convincingly and in such detail Suspicions escalated when a London tabloid printed the account of a cabbie who claimed to have seen Fairchild suddenly disappear from the coach, startling the cabbie's horse and causing it to bolt. And so it was that on the night of July 17, 1848, a group of eight drunken rowdies broke into Fairchild's home intent on stealing the crystal. When Fairchild confronted them in the parlor, he was attacked and killed with a fireplace poker. The shouts, however, had alerted neighbors, and the police arrived in time to apprehend the thugs. For at least six months after Fairchild's death, you couldn't go anywhere in London without seeing his name on the front page of pretty much every tabloid they had at the time. There was the trial, of course, the hangings, and the uncertainty about what had happened to his wife and his daughter. His publisher tried to cash in on all that, and so he commissioned other authors to write Cornwall Jack stories. But those were knockoffs, and they were poorly received so the series quickly came to an end. It wasn't, however, the end of the rumors regarding the Fairchilds and the Purple Crystal, for on the night of the break-in and murder, neighbors and other eyewitnesses claimed to have seen Fairchild's wife Fiona and eight-year-old daughter Sarah looking out an upstairs bedroom window. Yet when the police arrived and searched the house, mother and daughter were nowhere to be found. Was it true, as many believed, that Fiona and young Sarah had used the stone to transport themselves to safety? If so, where on earth did they go? The answer can be found in the 1850 United States Census, which shows them living in a small township in central Wisconsin. Ten years later, in the 1860 Census, there is no mention of Fiona, but 20-year-old Sarah is now Sarah Fairchild McNamara, wife of Gilbert S. McNamara. Also listed is their eight-month-old son, Edward. It took quite a while, but I was finally able to locate a direct descendant of Sarah's son. I called him on the phone and explained that I was doing research and looking for information about a certain purple crystal that may have once belonged to a member of his family. And he said, oh, you must mean the one that's mentioned in that old letter. What old letter? And he said, the one in our family album. My great-great-grandfather, Gilbert McNamara, wrote the letter when he was in the Civil War. Look, I'll send you a copy. Maybe you can make some sense of it. Lord knows none of us ever could. And what a letter it was. Five days before the Battle of Fredericksburg, Gilbert McNamara, a captain in the 5th Wisconsin Infantry Regiment, wrote home to his wife Sarah, a well-known spiritualist in the Madison area. 
Dear Sarah, It seems that within the week my regiment shall surely head on to the field of combat, though I trust that I will live to see you and our fine young son again. I feel it best to write these words, that you may look upon them at some later date, should fate choose to deal with me unkindly. Still, because of you, my beloved, a beacon of hope glimmers amid the darkness of war. At this very moment, I hold in my hand the purple gemstone you saw fit to give me upon our parting. O oh, Sarah, if I were a better and braver man, I would have put the crystal to its test long since, and even now be at your side. But alas, I have delayed, worried as to what fate might befall me. Now time is running out, and I must face my fears, or pay the price in blood. So, my dearest wife, if by some calamity the stone should take me to a distant and savage land instead of home to you, Please know that neither the highest mountain nor the deepest ocean will keep me from finding my way back to your loving embrace, and we shall yet be together again. On the night before the Battle of Fredericksburg, Captain Gilbert McNamara retired to his tent for the evening and was never seen again. Or was he? It is said that the power of the purple crystal has led many down the road of deceit and broken promises, and that for some, the temptation to use the stone for ill-gotten gain and hedonistic pleasure is too hard to resist. Did such a fate befall Captain McNamara? In the fall of 1874, while on vacation in Paris, France, First Sergeant William Barrett swears he saw his old captain entering the Folies Berger. Upon pursuit, however, the well-dressed man in question seemingly vanished into thin air. Gilbert McNamara is an enigma. I don't doubt that he was actually seen in Paris, but what happened to him after that is anybody's guess. Did he keep the crystal? Did he lose it? Was it stolen from him? Did he give it away before he died? I have absolutely no idea how or when the crystal made its way to Tibet. Yes, Tibet. But that's exactly where the Nazis went looking for it in World War II. Blockbuster movies have been made and many books have been written about Nazi Germany's relentless pursuit of various sacred and occult objects. The person in charge of these quests was Heinrich Himmler, the ruthless leader of the SS, a man whose crimes against humanity are beyond description. High on the list of occult items that Himmler sought were the Ark of the Covenant, the Spear of Destiny, the Sacred Chalice, and the Purple Crystal, whose code name among the Nazis was Brother Thomas. In the late fall of 1939, Himmler sent an expedition to Tibet, where, according to intelligence reports, the crystal was purportedly being held in a Buddhist monastery high atop a remote Himalayan peak. Archival records reveal that the Nazi expedition did indeed procure the crystal. And one can only wonder what might have happened if the stone had actually come into Hitler's possession. But that was not to be. On a cold November morning, the stone was airlifted from Tibet, but somewhere over Germany, there was an onboard explosion and the plane went down. Himmler immediately launched an all-out search, but his efforts were futile and neither the plane nor its valuable cargo was ever located by the German military. Rather, it was an American infantryman who came across the wreckage and the crystal when Allied forces moved through Germany in the spring of 1945. At least, that's the account given by the woman who currently has the crystal, but her story has yet to be verified. Who is the woman who currently has the purple crystal? She is known as Lucy Strapler, 
and she claims to have inherited the stone from her late uncle, who brought it home with him as a spoil of war. To many people, the mysterious Lucy Strapler is every bit as legendary as the purple crystal itself. But that was not always the case. You know, until two years ago, Lucy Strapler was an invisible person. You might not even say hello to her on the street. Then, that TV show. And suddenly her name was everywhere. Blogs, tweets, YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest. Everyone had to have an opinion about what had happened. Lucy Strapler's sudden rise to fame began when she contacted noted TV personality Brad Whitley, host of the popular weekly program Strange Universe. The following is an excerpt from that now famous interview. So you're saying it's real, you're saying the crystal can actually transport you from one place to another, just like that. Just like that. Do you have the crystal with you now? Oh yes, yes, of course. Can I see it? Could you show it to me? Brad Whitley, meet Purple Tom Frosty. Okay, I, I see you're holding the crystal now, but you haven't gone anywhere, you haven't disappeared, why not? Because. Right now, I'm exactly where I want to be. But if you wanted to, you could go anywhere. You could disappear right this very second. If I chose to, yes. Surely you must realize that there are a lot of people out there who don't believe a word you're saying. People who think the stories about the Purple Crystal are pure nonsense. What would you say to them, to the doubters, to the naysayers? Well, I know what Purple Tom would say. He'd say that sometimes nonsense is the best sense of all. And then he'd probably do something whimsical just for the fun of it. Like this. Oh my God. Where did she go? This is unbelievable. I, astounding. It was a hoax. That's what I'm sure everyone thought in the beginning. Then the McKays came forward and their information put everything in a whole new light. These photos of Lucy Strapler, taken by the McKays, did much to sway public opinion. But Buck and Reba McKay had much more to share than just pictures. They had first-hand experience. Lucy lived next door to us for about six months. That was before the TV show. She was always wearing a long purple robe and great big sunglasses, even at night. It was so strange. That's why we started taking pictures of her over the fence. We thought she might be doing something illegal. She sure acted like she had something to hide. One time I saw her dragging a big box into her garage, and so I followed her to see if she needed any help with it. But when I got there, she was gone, and so was the box. It freaked me out. There wasn't anywhere for her to go. Weird stuff like that happened all the time. Let's just say we weren't exactly sad when she finally moved away. I don't know anything about a magic crystal, but I'm not surprised by what happened on the TV show. Lucy Strapler is one strange lady. With the publication of the McKay's story, the divide deepened between those who believed that Lucy and the crystal were for real and the debunkers who didn't. At the very heart of the debate was the controversial Peterson video, shot by R.J. Peterson while hiking in Northern California. Is that woman in the Peterson video really Lucy Strapler? I don't know. Could it be someone dressed up in a costume? Well, maybe. I don't think we're ever going to know for sure. But I don't think it really matters. What matters is that a lot of people did believe that it was Lucy, and they went looking. My book is about them, not her. Of all the true believers who went looking for Lucy, Brad Whitley remains the most famous and the most enigmatic. 
after Lucy disappeared on the show, uh, Brad became obsessed with finding her in the crystal, and it's all that he would talk about. Then one night, he, he called, and he said that he knew where Lucy was. She'd sent him a letter asking Brad to meet with her. Um, he had directions and a map, and he told me to get my camping gear and video camera and to be ready to go first thing in the morning. The following is the unedited video taken by Monica Rikers during that fateful trip. Are you sure we're not lost? We've been driving through these trees forever. We're not lost. I know exactly where we are. Just a little further, and then we park and hike to the campsite. But why did we have to drive all the way up here to see her? If she can really go wherever she wants with that crystal, why didn't she just pop in to visit you in Brentwood? Something's not right. She's playing games with you. I don't care. I'll do whatever it takes to find out more about the crystal. Now turn off the camera. You'll run the battery down. Save it until we're with Lucy. <sighs> oh, all right. But I have a really bad feeling about this. Okay, I'm inside the tent, and I've turned on the camera because I can't find, I can't find my flashlight, and I can't find my cell phone, and Brad is gone. I woke up, and he was gone, and I don't, I don't know where he is. I keep calling to him, but he doesn't answer, and there are some really weird noises outside. Brad, is that you? Because if you're messing with me, this is so not funny. Brad. Oh, all right. I can do this. All right. I'm going out. I'm going outside now. I'm going outside to look for Brad. Brad, is that you? Oh my god. The next thing I remembered was waking up inside the tent. Um, it was morning. Brad was outside packing up the car. Um, the whole drive home, we barely talked at all. No, we just drove. We got back Saturday night, um, and he dropped me off at my place, and that's the last time I saw Brad. I haven't seen or heard from him since. Not one word. When Brad Whitley failed to report for work the following Monday morning, Ms. Rikers drove to Brad's house in Brentwood to check on him. His car was in the garage. His keys, wallet, and phone were on the dining room table, but there was no sign of the popular TV host. Monica did find, however, a four by six inch photo with the following message written on the back. Footage from home surveillance cameras show Brad entering his front door at 3.12 p.m. Sunday afternoon, the day before his disappearance. From that point on, no one entered or exited the premises until Monica Riker showed up Monday morning and used her key to let herself in. The first week or two, I think people really thought his disappearance was just a publicity stunt, um, but I never believed that for a second. It's been almost two years now. If he's not with Lucy Strapler, where is he? To this day, the search for Brad Whitley remains ongoing. When the police investigation stalled, the studio hired me to look into the matter. I have to say that in my 36 years on the job, this is one of the toughest missing person cases I've ever dealt with. There isn't much to go on, and I keep hitting dead ends. But something will turn up sooner or later. It always does. Do I think the Strapler woman's involved? Definitely. But people don't just vanish into thin air. There's a perfectly rational explanation for what happened to Brad Whitley. I just haven't found it yet. Will a rational explanation for Brad's disappearance ever be found? Surprisingly, a possible answer may lie in the field of modern physics. Uh, theoretically, for some time now, 
uh, people have been exploring this idea that you can go from one place to another or even one time to another uh, in, a, in a way that doesn't involve sort of classical Newtonian physics. And it sort of drops out of uh, Einstein's equations of general relativity. We don't have any experimental evidence of things moving from one place to another in a nonlinear way or moving in time. But that theory has been verified experimentally, whether it's the precession of Mercury's orbit or the slight time differences you can see in uh, geosynchronous satellites. When everyone's probably seen this before. You know, imagine you have these two points separated by distance on this page. Classically, the fastest way from one point to another would be a straight line, just going from one to the other. But if you allow for space to be curved, you could have a situation where the paper itself is curved and these two points that were previously 11 inches apart are now right on top of one another. And you know what is this when you have these two points which are you know separated in a conventional sense of space, but because it's curved, they can exist in the same place at the same time. That connection is the Einstein-Rosen bridge, or as you know, science fiction likes to call it, the wormhole. When you usually talk about wormholes, people understand it as being it would transport you physically to a different location. But you know, it goes back to that. Um, the general theory of relativity, where essentially time and space are related. And that is a bizarre concept to wrap your head around, but the same way that you could be transported through space to a different location by one of these Einstein Rosen bridges, a transversible sustainable wormhole, you could also be transported in time. Is it merely an eerie coincidence that the characteristics of a wormhole so closely mirror the mysterious attributes that have long been associated with those of the purple crystal. Do the stories told about the stone throughout the ages have a basis in scientific reality? Have Brad Whitley, Lucy Strapler, and the countless others who have inexplicably disappeared slipped through a wormhole in time and space? Could the purple crystal itself actually be a unique type of wormhole? We don't know how to make a wormhole. No, no one's ever seen a wormhole. Uh, we just know that it's possible from uh, the math in general relativity. Uh, but we could start to imagine and investigate and think about what it would take to make a wormhole. Uh, the first feature that is absolutely required is extremely strong gravity. You need enough gravity for space time to curve enough around on itself so that it could connect to another point in space. And the way you would achieve this gravity are either through extremely massive objects, collapse, suns, uh, things of that nature. Uh, but the other way you could do it is through extremely dense objects. And when you start talking about making an object dense, what needs to happen is you need to pack more matter into a smaller package. Uh, and there's a whole field of study dedicated to basically understanding the different ways you can pack stuff uh, you know, into a given volume, what shapes and configurations you can use. And uh, this field of study is called crystallography. It's, it's a branch of material science that deals with the structure and nature of crystals. That's what a crystal is. It's, a, it's an organized set of atoms that are organized in a very specific pattern. So if you were looking for like a small compact way to have a, a wormhole, it would need to be something that had a very dense structure uh, packed super efficiently like we'd find in a crystal. Um, the other thing, the problem you'd run into with wormholes is uh, what they call tidal forces, which are as you approach something that's extremely massive and has strong gravity, it'll tug on your feet more than it tugs on your head because the, the force of gravity falls off as one over the distance squared. So in addition to having something that was dense, you'd also, it would also have to be very strong and be able to you know, take these tidal forces and not be destroyed. And again, what kind of material is, you know, has this kind of strength? Well, it's a crystal. So theoretically, if you, if I were going to start to think about how I would create a, a, a wormhole, uh, I would have to start with crystals. Whether the power of the purple crystal can be explained by a scientific theory, or whether the stone possesses a magic beyond the scope of human understanding, one fact remains indisputable. When it comes to the legendary purple crystal, nothing is ever as it seems. Surely you must 
must realize that there are a lot of people out there who don't believe a word you're saying. People who think the stories about the purple crystal are pure nonsense. What would you say to them, to the doubters, to the naysayers? Well, I know what Purple Tom would say. He'd say that sometimes nonsense is the best sense of all. And then he'd probably do something whimsical just for the fun of it. Like this.